Hi, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show, the show for animal training and behavior nerds, where I, Ryan Cartledge, interview the world's most proficient animal training and behavior geeks. We're absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. So make sure you hit that subscribe button on whatever you're listening to this on so that you don't miss a single episode. Each episode of this show is brought to you on behalf of the ATA membership. And if you like the conversations in this episode, then you're invited to continue them with like-minded behavior nerds within the membership area, which you can find out more about at www.animaltrainingacademy.com. Once part of the ATA tribe, you'll get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help problem solve your training challenges. Plus, we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forum areas. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. But we will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one Bex Tasker. Bex is a lifelong behavior and training nerd with a special interest in positive reinforcement training for horses and their humans. She is dedicated to promoting principles of compassion, clarity and consent within horse-human partnerships. Almost 20 years of positive reinforcement training and the excitement of being able to talk to the animals has not dimmed. She is known for clicker training any animal that crosses her path, including pigs, rabbits, dogs, fish, cows, sheep, cats, and her own child. Her first animal job in her 20s was with guide dogs and custom detector dogs. But more recently, via her business Positively Together, she is focused primarily on horses. Bex travels around New Zealand teaching clinics on positive reinforcement for horses, as well as delivering online courses to horse trainers from around the world. She has a new but thriving youth program for teenagers, focused on personal development via ethical horsemanship, and has recently delivered a string of workshops for businesses on how to inspire behavior change in their staff and clients using positive reinforcement principles. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome one Bex Tasker to the show today who is patiently waiting by. Bex, thank you for taking time to come and hang out with us here at Animal Training Academy. Thanks, Ryan. I'm super excited. <laughs> Not that you don't hang out with us at Animal Training Academy on a regular basis because you've been a member for quite a while now. And uh, it's a rare pleasure for me to uh, welcome someone to the show who is just down the road, is from New Zealand. So I'm excited about that. We've got the double Kiwi accent going on today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, everyone's hopefully going to be enjoying this, if not struggling to understand what we're saying. We'll try to articulate our words for you, everyone. <laughs> hey, let's dive straight into the first question today, Bex. Could you please take everyone listening back to the start of your journey, where you first learned about positive reinforcement animal training and share with us some stories from that time. Sure. So I um, have had horses and dogs all my life, um, but it wasn't until I I got out of horses in my late teens, got a, a boyfriend like so many girls do, got out of horses, uh, especially when I had to start paying for them myself, um, and got a dog. And the first dog that I got was an Alaskan Malamute, which was um, an incredible learning um, curve, shall we say. Um And I took him along to a domestic obedience class. It was sort of one of those, you know, suburban classes. There was an older English lady who would march us around in circles. We were all wore choke chains and, you know, teaching the dogs to heal and things like that. Uh, But so this would have been about the year 2000. Um, But at the end of that six week or whatever it was course, she handed out clickers which in hindsight seems quite strange. I remember she had border collies and she did film work with her border collies. So probably that's where she got them from. I don't think from memory she knew much about what they were for or how they worked, but on the back of that clicker, and I still have it, I should really frame it, (laughs) put it on the wall. On the back of that clicker was KarenPryorClickerTraining.com. And I went home and got on the website and researched and basically dived into 
years of just everything that I could possibly read. Um, started with the website Red Don't Shoot the Dog, just was completely obsessed for a very long time and to be fair still am um, almost 20 years later with learning everything that I could about behavioural science and learning theory and how animals learn um, because I think the thing was I felt like this fog had been lifted. I felt like, you know, I'd had horses. I, I was um, show jumping and, and doing all this stuff with my horses and my dog at home but never really understood how what I was doing was working and why it was working. And I felt like suddenly I just had this, the fog had lifted. It had all just been unlocked for me and I could sort of read the, read the code all of a sudden. And that was super exciting. So, um, so that's how I first um, discovered positive reinforcement um, and continued on with the dogs um, and then got into um, horses again about five years later um, and started attempting to train them with positive reinforcement. Um, I say attempting because it didn't go too well. I tried to train my horses like they were dogs. Um, and yes, the principles of learning theory are the same, no matter the species. However, um, it, uh, horses really require uh, quite different foundation behaviours and um yeah, they're, 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 quite, they're quite different to train in my experience than dogs are. So it took me quite a while to figure out how to get through um, those early stages. Um, I created a couple of horses that I had. I created a lot of anxiety and biting and mugging and, um, you know, foraging for food and those kind of behaviours. Um, it wasn't much fun for the horse in the early days when I was still figuring it all out, but I've gotten a lot better at it since. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, we often say we feel sorry for the animals that we train in those times, but grateful for the lessons that uh, they helped us learn. Yeah, yes, exactly. Um, so, I mean, we used to, I used to do a lot of sled dog racing uh, with my Malamu, and I remember sitting in the um, you know in the middle of the forest at, uh, on these these overnight sled dog racing camps, and I'd, I'd ha- have all these Mal- all my friends Malamutes and Huskies, and I'd be target training them and stuff around the around the fire in the hall, um, because certainly with those kind of dogs, there was a lot lot of alpha rolling a lot of talk about dominance based theories um in terms of how people manage their dogs um so i really enjoyed introducing that population of dog owners to positive reinforcement um yeah i got really into it i went along to a big pet expos and and took my malamute and had him do all his tricks and um imported clickers from uh the US and, and wrote, wrote little booklets and gave them away to people and was basically just trying to um, convert as many, as many people as I could. Um, yeah, so that was that was kind of my early days of, of positive reinforcement training. Um, I was, yeah, pretty, pretty obsessive. Um, went on to train customs drug detector dogs, um, which was an amazing experience. Um, I probably burned out a little bit after a couple of years. Um, I felt, felt I had some... They trained with positive at that point. They were training with positive reinforcement for the actual searching for the drugs. So I was working particularly at Auckland Airport and in the mail centre and on some container ships and things like that. Um, but the obedience stuff, which happened before you graduate, was all um, choke chains. So this this really big black Labrador that was my um, dog. His name was Oscar. Um, he was one of New Zealand's first uh, white powder only detector dogs. So he was looking for heroin and cocaine and such things. Um, and he was he was large. Um, and basically, the advice that I got from uh, the trainers at that time was just to put more muscle into it, jerk harder on the choke chain, basically. Um, and I vividly remember taking him, putting him in the van, feeling frustrated, putting him in the van and driving and hiding behind a warehouse at, at Auckland Airport and um, clicker training him to walk on a loose lead and to sit when he needed to sit and do all those things because. Um, I had such strong ideas about how I felt animals should be trained and um, I just didn't, I didn't cope well with being told how to train my animals. I, I, do, I do much better working for myself like I do now. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, I, that, I, I lasted a couple of years in, in detector dogs and it was an amazing experience and I learned a lot. And in hindsight, there was a lot that I w- would do better now um, running an operational dog, but, um, but yeah, it's all, it's all part of the journey. Yeah. I feel like there's people in this audience that might be in the position that you were in when you were working with the detector dogs, but now in 2019. So you shared with us that you'd go and hide behind a 
shed and train the dog using positive reinforcement, thinking about all you've learned with regards to positive reinforcement and training humans uh, and everything else that comes with that over the uh, intervening time between then and now, what might you have? What advice or what offerings might you have to share with those people who might be in similar positions, positions that share similarities with the ones you just described? It's it's tricky. I was. Um I think these days it's, well, I know um, in certainly, you know, the organisations that I'm aware of, uh, they are beginning to use a lot more like marker training and positive reinforcement generally. Um, So it's hopefully less of an issue these days. Um, um, It was challenging in that I was in my early 20s and I'm dealing with a very male-dominated culture and, um, you know, the the police dog instructors um, were... Um, using a lot of aversives and very strong aversives. Um, I, and I'm, I'm not sure that in putting myself back there, I'm not sure I could have challenged them um, because of the, you know, the, the, um, the hierarchy that, that I was in, the situation that I was in. Um, but certainly if I had had more maturity and experience, I would have been able to at least question what they were doing. And, you know, they may well have, been okay with me doing what I did um I don't know but at that time I certainly felt like I needed to um because I was going directly against their advice in terms of how to resolve these uh, problems particularly around the obedience side like I say the actual searching operational work was all positive reinforcement and you are really having to balance I mean I remember the struggle of balancing um operational requirements in terms of what the dog needed to do versus the dog's training requirements and um you know uh, I remember one team leader at Auckland Airport complaining about me because I was insisting that my dog did another training search and had a rest before we continued with operational work. Um, and I didn't at that time have the mentors and the, um, the people sort of backing me up um, that had my back to, to support me in my decisions around managing my dog's um, needs. Um, so probably I could have potentially uh, done more to try to find, um, you know, d- talking to my seniors, talking to senior handlers and trainers about my dog's needs rather than just um, kind of charging on by myself and trying to manage it on my own. Yeah, it's a tricky one though. It is a tricky one. Mm. I myself have been in my 20s in similar situations, uh, having, or oh, now I'm grateful for the lessons I learned, but not so proud <laughs> shall we say of how I potentially managed the situations at the time but it's a pretty pretty challenging situation to be in I'm interested about what New Zealand was like at this time you first got handed that clicker I feel in 2019 uh, we're very connected now with the internet and all of these learning opportunities we have but we still don't have clicker expo in New Zealand all of these great mentors we have you know we're not meeting them in pe- person they are uh, expensive places Plan rides away. What was it like back then? With like even less available. How did how did you how did you kind of did you find a community, or were you just kind of feeling by yourself the whole time? Or um, I went. Yeah, it was definitely lonely. And I mean, you know, from today's um, standards, it was very lonely. Um, obviously, this was all very much pre social media and all that kind of stuff. It's certainly a lot easier now to find your tribe, to find your community. Um, these days, um, I was working off of. I mean, I was involved uh, um, in all of those Yahoo groups and the, like the the, um, the email groups, the Clicker Solutions, and all those amazing groups of people with some of the trainers who are now absolutely at the top of their game. And back then, we're still in that kind of um, exploratory phase. Um, not that we're not always in an exploratory phase, but you know, it was it was um, there was some exciting stuff happening then, and it was cool to kind of be. A, a bit of a voyeur. I mean, I wasn't exactly part of that, but I was certainly watching with interest some of these um, some of these these names that I now know as the Clicker Expo faculty and things like that. Um, and I went to as many uh, seminars and conferences and things as I could. And there was a few coming through in the dog world. So um, you know, and I've maintained um, a bit of a tribe. 
um, through doing getting to know people like that in the dog world. Whereas when I started to shift, so after I left customs and I felt a little bit burned out, I realized that I wasn't even enjoying my dog training anymore, which had been my overriding life passion. Um, and I and I just had a bit of a break from that, and I and that's when I started doing it with the horses. I was very alone at that point because you know in the dog world. I mean, I, I took my dogs to agility training and I managed to find a club um, who was training with, with the clicker. So, you know, so I was around people. I, I managed to, I, I intentionally sought out people who, um, you know, who, who I could um, consider to be a bit of a like-minded community. But when I moved away from dogs and into horses, I was absolutely alone. There was, there was nothing. I was importing VHS videos from, <laughs> from the States and, um, and um, you know, just, yeah, there was really, I was just battling through completely by myself and making all the mistakes um, and um, tearing my hair out and crying and saying, I can't, it doesn't work on horses, it's not going to work. And then trying again because I just felt so strongly at a gut level that this is what I wanted to be doing and that it did make sense. And obviously, there's something wrong here. And, you know, I had Alexandra Curlin's book, um, but the, you just can't, for me, it wasn't enough. I, I you know, I would have liked to have someone teaching the kind of clinics that I'm teaching now. <laughs> and there just wasn't that back then. Yeah. We have talked about these things called VHS videos and Yahoo groups before in this podcast. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so it's, it's really, oh no, it's really neat that these are recurring uh, resources that podcast guests talk about when they talk about uh, their stone age. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so something that sticks out to me is, you know, you and I together this year uh, have been to Susan Freeman's and Peter Clark's learning th- event in Australia together. We've been to Ken Ramirez's his APDT uh, five day was it five days three day workshop uh, here yeah, in been very lucky here in New Zealand. Yeah, and you know we're not complaining at all about living so far away because we do have these amazing opportunities. Uh, and you and I have uh, had some fun. You invited me to come and hang out at one of your clinics and get to geek out about animal training and behavior. And you've just shared you're going to Clicker Expo in America mm-hmm. next year. Um, so something that sticks out to me is, is your desire to never stop learning, um, you know, and, and paired that with what you're telling us now about you kind of going behind the shed with your dog, uh, you <laughs> jumping into the horse world and, and kind of being quite lonely. Like I'm, I'm interested to learn more about your mindset. Like where, where does your drive and motivation um, come from to keep, to keep learning and to keep kind of questioning the norm uh, and doing and, and and following your gut, which I, which I'm interpreting as you telling us is saying to you, hey, there's a better way to do this. How, how does yeah, your mind yeah. work? Yeah, and I had some, you know, in terms of um, following my gut. I mean, I had some experiences early on that I think helped to shape that, um, as as I'm sure does everyone. You know, I've got a vivid memory of being about 15, and I was um, so this was before I knew anything about anything, but I was show jumping um, at a relatively high level, and my horse continued to to badly. Um, uh, stop at jumps and try to basically nap, which means try to move sideways out of the arena. He didn't want to be there. Um, and I couldn't um, do anything about it. He was a big animal and I was a skinny little 15 year old and my trainer got on him and rode him away. And he, when he came back, he had welts all over his rump, um, big ones. And, um, and you know, things like that, things like the police dog instructor who took my dog Oscar off me when I was down there for my graduating course um, and jerked the choke chain so hard that Oscar screamed and flew through the air. Um, and I had to not show that I had tears in my eyes because I was this silly little girl and they were these older men in the police force. And yeah. So those kind of experiences are what probably formed such a strong gut feeling that I know what is ethically right and the way that I want to be treating my animals um, and interacting with my animals. And so that those experiences obviously uh, um, form a large part of sort of that side of things. Um, in terms of the desire to learn, I just... I don't know, it's, I just find it all so exciting. Like, how could you not want to be the best at this you could ever be? Because it's just so much fun. And, like, once you get really good at training a dog, then you've got all these other animals that are just actually completely different. And, um, uh, yeah, whether it's just silly, fun stuff, it's the conversation, it's the dialogue that I'm having with 
the animal as I'm training them um, that I just find so incredibly exciting and to get better at that and to be, you know, yeah, I just, I just never get sick of learning about this stuff. So um, I am an analyst by nature. Um, when I burned out from customs, I went into intelligence within law enforcement. I was in law enforcement intelligence for about 10 years. Um, that's what my master's is in criminal intelligence. Um, so I am a bit of an analyst, a bit of a researcher, naturally. I've got, you know, that's sort of how I'm built. But, um, but yeah, it's just, it's the fun of just how much fun is this? Like I want to get really, really good at this. I want to be better at this. I want to train new things. I want to train new kinds of animals. It just never gets boring. So, yeah. And I've been to your to your clinics and uh, you've had the ones I've been to and the learning opportunities that you offer that I've been to. Uh, there's been a pretty broad range of, of uh, people there, some who have been clicker training for a number of years, some who this is their first kind of introduction to positive reinforcement uh, and holding a clicker in their hand with their horse on the other side of them. Um, how has how has your experience in in the challenges that you're faced in your career? How has it helped you become a better teacher now? Is it have you kind of are you kind of in front of those people when you see Bex Tasker in them? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think it helps um, to have compassion, doesn't it? Um, to be able to understand. And arguably, arguably, I've got less of that than some. You know, I've got some um, colleagues who have come through quite a traditional horsemanship background as an adult and done a lot of learning in what we call natural horsemanship and then have changed to positive reinforcement, whereas I've been training with positive reinforcement all of my adult life. Um, so I may not have... Um, I can't exactly look back and, and think of things that I've done with my horses that I deeply regret and that I never I never trained with really aversive methods with my horses. I was lucky enough to discover it quite early. Um, but at the same time, there's always things that we wish we'd done better. And I think just having compassion for people at whatever stage they're at in the journey is really key as a teacher. And um, if you, I feel really strongly that we, as positive reinforcement trainers, you know, my goal, our goal is to spread the word as widely as possible, right? Is to get as much um, positive and, and non-aversive and humane and ethical training to as many animals and as many people as possible. Um, and to do that, we need to shape humans' behaviour. We need to welcome them with open arms, even if um, they're only want, they're only ready to dabble in it a little bit, or they're only beginning to discover it a little bit. I'll take it. If you wanna, if you wanna train your horse with, um, you know, traditional horsemanship methods, but you're gonna try using the clicker for one issue, like taking a worming tube, I'll take it. Come to my clinic, and we'll we'll teach you how to do that. And my experience overwhelmingly is that once people, a lot of people, once they have a play with it and they see it at the clinic and they really understand how it works and they play with it in the one issue that they might have that requires uh, work, then I'll talk to them six months later and they're absolutely clicker training for everything. You know, they 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 because they've realised how much fun it is and how, what a difference it makes to the horse. So I just think, yeah, it's super important to me that everyone is made to feel welcome no matter what stage they're at. Yeah. Could you say you, you celebrate approximations? Absolutely. That's exactly <laughs> what I what I aim to do all the time. <laughs> yeah. You like to spread yeah. riffles? Yeah, riffles, definitely. As many as possible. That's right. And, you know, like I think it's easy. And I see it a lot, particularly with, with I was going to say younger, but, you know, newer trainers to the positive reinforcement paradigm um, get very – I sometimes see them get quite kind of extreme and, and because they feel so strongly and so passionately about what they're doing and um, and, and the risk, of course, is that we can shut people out. And I've got um, one colleague um, here who I respect very highly who's relatively new to positive reinforcement and it took her many years to even learn about clicker training for horses because of the fact that she had run into quite um, clo close-minded um, people, in particularly in social media. So positive reinforcement training Trainers who were not welcoming, who were judgmental. Um, and so, she, you know, she, she's now spreading positive reinforcement ripples with her clients, but it took her more years than it should have because she she uh, didn't discover it as early as she could have, I guess, or embrace it as, as soon as early as she could have because of the fact that she unfortunately ran into um groups of people or individuals who weren't um, completely welcoming and who weren't necessarily celebrating approximations in terms of people who are new to positive reinforcement but have decades of experience in other types of animal training, other types of horsemanship. So, yeah. 
I'm very tempted to go into the metaphor of ripples now and how that applies to that situation, but I'm going to contain myself. Uh, you have to share a photo of that original clicker with us so we can include it in the write-up for yeah. this podcast. That'd be kind of neat. Sure. Um, before we move on to talk about the the middle part of the sandwich of this podcast, uh, bringing everyone listening up to speed now, what, what are you doing in 2019? You've kind of shared little snippets of that, but unpack that a little bit more and uh, where they can go to find out more, get in touch with you. Cool. So um, so my business is Positively Together. Um, so I started that up sort of officially uh, four years ago. Um, I've been training people in the odd clinic and stuff for a long time, but this is this is when I quit my what I used to call my real job and started doing this um, full time. I'm travelling around New Zealand and I'm teaching. So once or twice a month, I'm around New Zealand teaching clinics. Um, so for, in other words, two days, so over a weekend with um, eight to ten horses at each um, clinic. People coming to learn how to use positive reinforcement training with their horses. Um, I'm teaching like theory workshops, PowerPoint. Um, evenings, that kind of thing, about how animals learn generally. Um, and I'm also doing um, a, what I'm calling the youth program. So I'm, t- I'm doing increasingly more uh, lessons and group sessions with young people at my property with my own horses. Um, and those are around it's personal development it's life skills it's um teaching the principles of consent and compassion and how to be a good friend and all that kind of stuff um with positive reinforcement horse training as the medium for that so um you know you can't get um kids to buy into coming along to learn to be a better friend but you teach them about horse training and they're all about it right and there are so many parallels between um the way that we train ethically positive reinforcement training uh with animals and the way that we can become a better human so um so that's that's i'm really excited i'm really enjoying that that work um with youth as well so that's that's what i'm doing um amongst a variety of other things um I've actually just been invited to um, the US to teach a clinic next year, which um, will coincide with my trip to uh, Kentucky to go to Clicker Expo. So that's very exciting. Um, And yeah, I'm in terms of finding me, uh, Facebook is probably my major platform. So that's Positively Together um, on Facebook and on Instagram as well. Um, And my website is clickertraining.co.nz. So those are the, that's where to find out more. Um, And I have a Facebook group, um, which is free for anyone to to join. Um, And there I post like weekly um, short snack size kind of videos about different topics and um, that kind of thing. And I'm also running online courses as well. So yeah, lots of balls in the air. Awesome. And we'll link to all of this in the write-up for this podcast. So uh, if you needed to go back and find this after you finish listening, then you can find it on the ATA website. Hey, thanks so much for sharing all of that so far, Bex. I love hearing about people's behavioral odysseys, as we like to call them here. And your odyssey still has a long way to go. I'm excited to see what you get up to over the next four years. Uh, Moving forward, though, I'd like to unpack even more some of the things that you've already talked about today and some of the things you just started to talk about just then as you're describing what you do in 2019. But this is more a bigger umbrella about how positive reinforcement has helped change your life. And when we caught up to discuss topics for this episode, this is what you told me that you really wanted to talk about. And so you've prepared five things to share with us about how positive reinforcement with horses has taught you about leading a better life and also about training other species, including humans. Can you share this list of amazingness with us, please, Bex? (laughs) Sure. Um, So as a bit of context, um, I think the big kind of epiphany for me over the last four years, you know, when I started this business, I was about helping horses. I was about... um, Uh, trying to help the horse world catch up with the dog world in terms of um, where the general understanding and use of positive reinforcement is concerned. Um, And what I'm increasingly realising is that I'm less about training horses and I'm actually more about training people. Um, 
we train an animal and we help that animal. We inspire and educate a person and we're helping every animal that that person will ever come into contact with for the rest of their lives. So I'm becoming um, increasingly aware that that's probably where my deepest passion actually lies is in um, inspiring behavior change and understanding and, um, you know, influencing humans um, for the, for the greater good, so to speak. Um, and the way that positive and becoming increasingly aware too of how positive reinforcement principles and, and the life uh, that um, the, the way that they have impacted my life over, over the last almost 20 years. So I've got a five-year-old son. So just becoming a, a parent, I've, I guess I'm realizing I've got more of an appreciation for the wider life impact of positive reinforcement um, and who I am as a result of, of the last few decades of, of animal training and of focus on, on um, positive reinforcement. So it's not, just a hobby which results in well-trained pets right it's life-changing impacts I'm a better mother because I'm a positive reinforcement animal trainer I'm a better friend I'd like to think I'm a better wife I don't know what my husband would say about that um yeah so you you know I, I find myself using positive reinforcement principles using tag teach principles um in my everyday life um so even teaching so teaching groups of people in clinics which is um probably the thing that i most enjoy doing um is group you know teaching groups of people and in order to learn effectively a human's got to feel safe and creating that safe supportive environment in a group learning um situation is the responsibility of the coach so helping them to feel confident to ask questions you know and these are all the things we're doing with our animals when we're training our animals too um so that's kind of the context for where this is all gone um where it's come from when i became a parent if i was going to say that i follow a parenting approach of any kind i would i would name rye which is r-i-e that's a parenting approach from magda gerber um if anyone's interested in that janet lansbury does an amazing job of writing blogs and um, incredible amounts of resources for parents and really that's all about viewing babies and children as unique humans worthy of our respect and trust um, which is such a centre, uh, such a, a core part of how I like to train my horses too um, having respect for them as individuals and the um, the fact that they you know they, they've got their own motivations and their own lives that are outside of me um, rather than seeing our horses and our other animals as um, something that we use or, uh, you know, especially in the horse world, you know, often the horse is less a, a friend and more of a tool, more of a piece of sports equipment for some people. That's, you know, they would never say that. They love their horses, but it is still ultimately very kind of a human-centric thing. It's what can the horse do for me? Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of the, the background behind um, what led me to suggest that topic. Um so if I was going to say five things, um, I'm going to start with gratitude. So five things that positive reinforcement animal training, horse training has taught me about leading a better life. Um, gratitude, you know, positive reinforcement training um, by definition means that we need to see, we need to notice the good things, right? If we're going to reinforce behavior and get more um, of the behavior that we want, then we need to first notice the behavior. Um, and so in itself, Training with positive reinforcement clicker training teaches, you know, that's my daily practice of gratitude. It teaches me, it trains me to, to notice, to overcome the normal human negativity bias where we focus in on the things we don't like more than we do on the, on the desirable things. Um, and, you know, every time I'm, I'm out there training, I'm practicing gratitude, um, seeing the good things. And my experience is that that, seeps out into your wider life and you know it becomes a cornerstone habit um so oliver is five and a half um and i i believe that i'm better at noticing and acknowledging those little day-to-day -day moments the things that he's doing right um you know if he's patiently waiting while i have a phone call with someone or a conversation with someone um i find it easier to to actually notice and acknowledge him for doing that um because of the fact that this is every day, right? When we're training, we're, we're doing that. We're acknowledging and noticing the good things um, rather than just waiting for the, the behavior we don't like and correcting it, which would obviously be the, the more traditional animal training model. Um, and actually, when you look around, you realize that there is a lot of people who are parenting that way as well. Um, yeah, so gratitude would be the first thing on my list. 
compassion um, would be another. So this is huge. And, you know, like we, you mentioned we went to Susan Friedman's uh, and Peter Clark's, um, what do you call that? It wasn't a seminar. It was four days of amazingness anyway. Um, you know, and they, you know, obviously Susan Friedman talks a lot about what's the function. Um, what's the, you know, what's the function of the behaviour, understanding why the animal's doing what it's doing. Um, and to me, that's one of the core things, that, you know, of, of compassion, if we can understand what's the function of, of the behaviour that we don't like. So I'm talking about particularly in a human. Um, and, and, you know, another Susan Friedmanism is the unlabel me movement, right? And if you think about it, unlabel me is really about, and everyone's trying their best, it's about looking, giving people the benefit of the doubt. This is the way that I unpack it anyway, that I frame it in terms of my interactions with other humans. Um, you know, he's not being... Uh, lazy or um, rude or selfish. It's you know what what's the what's the function of that behaviour? What's really behind that? What am I seeing? And what might be the drivers for that? Um, so that I've got a I've got a fifteen year old student. Um, she's sixteen now. She's uh, she was having some trouble with some girls at school um, who were I wouldn't call it bullying, but it was pretty you know difficult sort of behaviour for her to deal with. Um, in the hallways and um, you know she used to get angry or upset about this as you can imagine that sort of um, you know being shoved or pushed or or blocked through doorways and that kind of stuff that, that teenagers sometimes do to each other um, but I'll never forget about a year ago she came to me and said that this had happened that this, these girls had, had been um, quite rough um, and uh, quite unpleasant to her in school and what she did is she sat down with her notebook and she wrote a functional assessment <laughs> for you know for those those um, those other students um you know she was she was talking about distant antecedents and and you know what might be driving that behavior and you know what might be happening at home that might be causing them to behave that way um and you know ultimately what that did was help her to empathize with the people who were doing that bullying behavior right um so I think that was a bit of, all of this has been some light bulbs for me in the terms of how we're taking things like you know, functional assessments, you know, ABCs and, and um, labels and, and the functions of behaviour and all that stuff which can seem quite dry and sciencey to some people, but actually this is at the core of humanity. Um, you know, for her to be able to, for a teenager to be able to sit down and be compassionate towards someone who's bullied her and to think logically about how she can arrange antecedents or consequences to influence the behaviour of those other teenagers who are acting in a way that she doesn't appreciate, that was just really exciting for me. Um, yeah, that, I mean, yeah. Um, Kathy Sileo um, gave an amazing quote. Wasn't that on your podcast? Was it on ATA one? She said, you can't seek to influence someone's behaviour from a position of contempt. Anyway, this, I wrote it down because I loved it. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I mean, I love Kathy Sidow. She's amazing. But that, that particular quote um, it jumped out at me because, again, it's, you know, it's about it's, this, this is the way that she was taught. She was referencing how we treat other people who train in different ways to us. Um, but it's just so applicable. These kind of principles are so applicable just across life, really. Um, <laughs> you asked for five. I'm on number three. Holding, holding space for another person, um, I don't know how else to, fra to phrase that. You could call it respect. Um, this is about acceptance. It's about, you know, um, acknowledging it's just behaviour. We don't need to take it really personally, um, which is such a, a relevant thing in the horse world. I find myself talking about this a lot with, with horse trainers about um, just accepting their behaviour, not taking it personally, not, not um, labelling it again. Um, it's, not, it's not dominance. It's not rudeness. It's not being naughty. It's, um, um, it, just, it just is. Let's describe what we're seeing and talk about how we can resolve it. And... Um, Again, particularly with horses, helping I find myself helping people a lot how to sort of remove the emotion from a situation. So um, not being, uh, not pandering or conceding, um, which I find that often people will fall on one side. Either they'll be very hard or they'll be overly pandering and conceding. And there's that nice middle ground of just acknowledging behaviour for what it is, um, being compassionate towards the animal or the person um, as to the reasons why they're behaving the way they are and just going about changing it if that's something that needs to be changed um, rather than pouring our own 
um, yeah, our own selves into that. I, I mean, I've, I read something recently about the difference between empathy and compassion, and that was kind of what they were getting at, um, that uh, compassion creates emotional distance, um, whereas empathy, you're feeling their emotions as your own, um, and therefore you can be clouded by your own biases rather than, um, yeah, just seeing it objectively. So I had a young horse years ago, um, who was super reactive, super nervous about all sorts of stuff. Um, life was anxiety for him. Um, and I spent a lot of years trying to avoid upsetting him, sort of tiptoeing around his reactivity, tiptoeing around the things that I knew would uh, make him nervous or make him respond, react. Um, I, essentially, I was uncomfortable with his discomfort. <laughs> um, and what I've realized now with a bit more experience is that actually what I needed to do is just hold space for him, just acknowledge that he's feeling that way and not avoid that, but help him work through it. So we're talking about counter conditioning and systematic sensitization, right? Like, you know, those, these are the practical frameworks for how to acknowledge an uncomfortable feeling, breaking it down, um, not taking it personally, but thin slicing it and working through it rather than just trying to avoid it. Um, so I think I made his, that horse's, you know, what I'm going to call anxiety worse because I was personally uncomfortable with his discomfort. Um, and I'm like that with humans too. I'm uncomfortable with conflict. Um, and I'm learning, you know, like the, the crucial conversations and the nonviolent communication and all that stuff is so important because it's helping, it's helping me to, um, yeah, to, to just, yeah, to, to be okay, to be accepting of other people's emotions and to not take it into myself and feel defensive or, or whatever. When my little boy uh, is anxious about something, I don't avoid the issue. I don't distract him. We talk about it. We talk about it openly and I coach him through it and we resolve how he's feeling. Or if it can't be resolved, then I just acknowledge the way he's feeling and um, accept that that's, that's the way it is. So strategies rather than avoidance and distraction. So it's all actually the same stuff. You can see how like the parenting thing and the horse training thing have just really kind of um, developed each other. Um, again, I, like I mentioned the Rye sort of philosophy. Um, one of the, one, an example of that strategy is uh, like toddlers squabbling over toys. Um, what, what someone with uh, the Rye approach would do in that situation is to calmly narrate what's actually happening just describe what's happening to the to the children rather than swooping in and helping them um, and helping them to avoid conflict actually just acknowledging and trusting them that that's um that's their journey and that they can manage that situation themselves um so i see this with horses where we micromanage our horses we're constantly over cueing we're telling them exactly what to do at every single moment instead of just um, respecting their own choices and their own um, the way that they manage their world and their body and things like that. So I often see people, for example, asking their horse to line up to a mountain block so that they can get on. And it will be, you know, can you take two steps forward and one step back and then I'm going to move your hip over and then I'm going to, you know, use the reins to, to move you this way. And and what, I'm, what I coach about in my clinics is actually – just let's explain to the horse what we want them to do and just allow them to do it rather than constantly uh, yeah, micromanaging their behaviour. And, um, and the horses really appreciate that, as you can imagine, because um, it allows them to think for themselves. It gives them autonomy um, over their own bodies and, you know, and some choice about how they do it. If I stand on the mountain block and hold my hands out in front of me, my horse will put his back, his saddle underneath my hands. I don't care how he does it. I don't care whether he takes two steps to the left or to the right or, you know, comes in laterally or what. Um, and because they understand what the behavior is they actually want rather than just mindlessly responding to cues, then, you know, I get a lot more enthusiasm and cooperation from the horse in terms of that kind of thing. It also means with mounted blocks that I can use it as a question. So if my horse doesn't respond to my cue to, to line up to the mounting block, then I know that he's not happy for me to get on. And I sure as heck am not going to get on a 600 kg animal, um, flight animal, if he isn't ready for me to do so. So it's good information for me as well. So this is where the control and the choice things come in, I guess, in everyday life. Um, another, another one that's super important to me, and I touched on it just then with talking about bodily autonomy, is consent. Um, so this is something that I talk about a lot with my with the youth um, that I work with. 
Um, and I may not talk about it explicitly, but you know, I'm 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 teaching primarily young girls, um, and issues of bodily autonomy and consent. This is life skills. This is crucial, um, obviously crucial for young men as well. But but you know, I'm particularly passionate um, about teaching these principles to to young women that if we um, if we can have compassion for our horse, if we can um, under read the body language of an animal. Um, and respect them when they say no to us, then I feel that um, those young women are going to be more likely to uh, internalise those messages and um, understand the importance and the fact that those principles apply to themselves as well in future years. So um, things like teaching kids to um, and adults to, to understand um, calming signals, um, body language from from horses. Um, my cat is a great help and my chickens also <laughs> in teaching these concepts um, when, when I do workshops at my place um, because, you know, if you don't approach her in the right way, then she just will walk away. You don't get to, you don't, you don't get a cuddle if you don't ask properly. Um, and, um, that's been, I've got a, a quite a few, a uh, couple of younger kids who are on the autism spectrum and their parents bring them to me for lessons for these reasons, because they want the kids to learn about concepts like compassion and consent. It's not just about getting on the horse and going for a ride. It's so much deeper than that. It's the underlying principles. Um, so I've got a pony called blue. He's a little guy he's for the for the smaller kids um he's just perfection but he's learned in his previous life that if he just plants his feet doesn't matter that he's small you can't move him um and so was, i mean he he gives great learning opportunities to the kids in terms of getting the consent of the other um of, of the animal they're working with so they i'll tell them to walk up there and and put his halter on um or to take him for a walk and he plants his feet and says i'm not going to move then they have to figure out well let's problem solve that what are we going to do about that because we don't we don't hit ponies at my place that's you know that's not what we do um so what what are we going to do we, you know we're not going to haul on his face that's not an option so you know because it doesn't feel good for him so what could we do and so you see them thinking about it and then they'll run and they'll find a target stick or they'll get some treats um so thinking about you know why is he doing that how could we so this is me coaching the kids through um, younger kids and teenagers. How can we provide reinforcement that will change his behaviour? So, you know, if he wants to eat the grass, what would he like more than grass? How could we help to get him on board so that we're doing this together rather than just um, you telling him what to do? If he's not on board with it, then you don't get to have fun. So you better have a think about how you can get him on board. And aren't these the same skills that these kids need to learn when they're interacting with their peers? You know, like it's all, it's all, you know, these, they're, they're, it's not just about how do we get the pony to cooperate. Um, it's about helping them to draw the parallels between what's happening in a lesson with an animal and what happens in their day-to-day -day life. Um, so, how, you know, I'll, I'll say to them, how can we set up, I won't use these words, but how can we set up the antecedents so that he's going to be more successful next time? You know, maybe we could let him to graze on the grass for an hour before the kids arrive or, um yeah, but all the, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's it's the work that Peggy and Eva and Emily are doing around start buttons. You know, all that kind of stuff adds so many more valuable layers and like structure and a framework to these concepts. So that's um, that my teenagers in particular really enjoy talking about and learning about start buttons and dialogue within training sessions and how they can get that communication going. And man, there's nothing more exciting for me than to see a, a young person having their first real conversation with an animal, you know, um, having actual dialogue with an animal and responding to them in as much as the animal's responding um, to the human and seeing that and, and, and they feel it and they get so excited about it. And once you've lit that spark, you know that they're set for life because they'll never accept anything else. Um, you know, uh, my my dream is to set up <clears throat> some kind of um, long-term community pony club alternative, I suppose I'd like to say, um, to support these kids because my concern is that I let, pan I, let I open up Pandora's box and then, and then where are they going to go from there? Um, yeah. Um, certainly with the youth, my goal is to just insulate them against the kind of um, views that they will get um, presented with when they go out to mainstream horsemanship. So, they, you know, I mean, I've, the number of stories I've heard of, of um, just the other weekend I was talking to a, a friend who's in her 30s, but she was recalling a, a story from when she was 10 and she used to cry because she didn't want to go to pony club because they would make her hit her pony. Um, 
you know, and, you know, I've got teenagers currently who have withdrawn themselves from Pony Club because they don't want to put a metal bit in their horse's mouth and that's a requirement for doing the sport that they that they want to do. And so, therefore, they're not able to compete in the sports that they that they want, that their peers are competing in and that they have fun doing because they are, are standing by their ethics and that makes me super proud. Um, the last one is self-awareness. So there's a great quote from Viktor Frankl that says, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. This is something probably that's quite close to my heart and that I remember being a kid and running around after my pony who refused to be caught and how angry I felt. Um, and knowing that when she eventually came to me and I eventually caught my pony that I wasn't able to take out that incredible anger on her because it wouldn't help anyone. But, you know, these feelings of fear or frustration or the knee-jerk reactions, um, you know, when we when we become animal trainers, we get better, I think, at identifying that, at sitting in that space between stimulus and response and being present and teaching ourselves to take a breath and think before reacting. Um, I think especially with horses because they're a thousand pound flight animal, they're dangerous. And a lot of the time people's anger or aggression or things like that with horses comes from a, a deep seated fear um, of the potential injuries and very real injuries. And all horse people have got broken bones and <laughs> stories about the injuries they've had. And so it's not, a, it's not a, a thing to be dismissive of, but teaching ourselves how to take a breath and just to think before we react and how to manage our emotions control our mind chatter and our breathing and our energy levels so that we can be the person that our horse needs us to be. Yeah. So that's five things for you, Ryan. <laughs> can you repeat that Victor Frankl quote for us? So between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. It's amazing. And that's kind of what we're teaching animals a lot of the time as well. Yes, exactly, exactly. Like, you know, again, with horses who have such an incredibly fast reaction time and for whom safety is absolutely the most important priority, physical safety, you know, they're constantly at fear of the mountain lion that's about to jump out from behind the tree, um, teaching them to, to, to be able to, to think rather than just react is crucial for our safety when we work with them um, and for their own well-being, really. So, um, so absolutely, we're doing it with our animals all the time. Um, but, you know, we could always, all of us humans, could could do with a little bit more of that as well I think so many ripples being spread and you even used the word spark and then we did a podcast of Linda Ryan last year I believe uh, she talked about sp spreading <laughs> I'm challenged to say this because of the articulation required spreading sparks <laughs> and uh, you, you were doing a lot of that so let's go through that list I really love that first one gratitude so we're, le we're learning to look more for the things we like and as I reflect on my role as uh, someone who moderates, for lack of a better word, I don't like that word, but we'll use it for now, moderates uh, communi online communities. Uh, I feel sometimes, and, and I'm not even talking about Animal Training Academy community here because they're awesome, but other ones that I see, um, we, we as positive reinforcement trainers sometimes forget to do that when we're giving feedback, when we're engaging with other people. We, we don't necessarily look for what the person we're communicating with is doing correctly. We somehow revert back to examining those things that we don't like, that they're not doing. For you, how did, how did you kind of – is that something that you initially had to work through or were you always kind of able to look at all situations and pick out the things you like? And what, what do you – can you just unpack, unpack this a little bit more because I think that we're, we're in such a um, – uh, important phase of learning how to engage with each other online that I think there's a little bit of value in just uh, talking about that a little bit more. Yeah, um, I don't know whether it's something that I've just always done or whether it's come from, um, I guess, my my learning as an animal trainer, as a, as a positive reinforcement trainer. Um because for me, that's it's. I was a different person when I was eighteen years old, <laughs> and so um, so this is yeah yeah. Um, but in terms of um, noticing the good and acknowledging the good, I agree with you. I think it's quite common for people who uh, can be quite skilled at doing this with our animals to not be so good at doing it with humans. Um, particularly when you've got a screen and a keyboard between you and the other human. So I think that the virtual nature of much, much of our communication these days can decrease uh, compassion. Um, 
which means that we are less likely to notice the good stuff, which which is that that gratitude piece that you're talking about. So um, I like to be conscious. <clears throat> I like to be um, to to take this to top of mind. Um, so I mean, like like you, I I, I um, admin um, Facebook groups for want of a better word, create communities, create tribes. This is one of my great passions. Um, I think, again, because when I was younger, I didn't have that. When I was new, you know, as we've talked about, I didn't have that community around me and I wanted it. And so that's um, one thing that I consider to be a really important role um, is to to create communities and and get people together so they can support each other, um, irrespective of of me and what I might be doing. Um, And... It's a it is a, it's about calling it to the surface, and you know you do a, a beautiful job. Anyone who's been in the ATA communities has seen this in practice, um, and it, I have taken learnings from the way that you manage the ATA community into my own positively together with your horse Facebook group, um, which is the free one um, that anyone can join. Um, but it's the same sort of thing that when you're managing groups of people, group psychology is fascinates me. The way that you know different personalities. Um, can influence the overall culture and feel of a group. Um, So obviously having 10 to 20 people in front of me in a small group training session um, is a lot easier than when you've got 500 people on a Facebook group, most of whom you don't know. Um, So you're bringing it to the surface, I think, and just calling it out all the time. So in my online courses, um, I use tag teach principles um, in terms of um, I actually give them tag points that they need to work towards for themselves and click points that the that the horse needs to work towards and when they um post video they have to talk about um what it is that they like about what they've done um and if they're going to comment on someone else's um uh, posts then you know one of the one of the rules is that you need to be constructive and you need to talk about what you think that the person did well um so all those all those kind of things i think putting structure and framework to it can help people to actually translate the concepts from animal training into interactions with humans yeah awesome i love all of that and what a huge ripple getting a teenage teenager to do a functional assessment on um, some other some of her peers that she was having a challenging time with. That's amazing. It was yeah, that was very cool. And it's not the only similar story, you know, from from these kids that I'm working with, where they're actually going, well, actually, you know, this person's being really unpleasant, but maybe she's got something going on at home. You know, maybe maybe her dad's just left, or maybe she's, you know, like I mean, who knows? You know, like literally, maybe grandma's just died, or maybe, you know, maybe she was actually really upset because when I'm upset, this is how I behave and I get really cold and distant. Um, and so maybe that's why she's doing that rather than that she's being a bitch or, you know, so actually just that, you know, that, I mean, to take it from what is essentially, you know, yeah, a functional assessment through to ultimately it's, it's compassion. It's having, having compassion for another human and therefore helping yourself by not feeling so hurt. And yeah, it's very exciting. I love it. The crossover is exciting. <laughs> Maybe she's just having a bad day rather than being a bitch. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Pretty much. And, you know, can't we all feel better if we have that attitude? <laughs> <laughs> so looking at time, we should push on. But just to go through that list again, and I, and I absolutely love this. I don't think we've kind of taken this angle on things before in such a f- uh, intentional a conversation but the five things that I'm going back to my notes here to make sure that what I say now matches up with what I said at the start five things how about how positive reinforcement of horses has helped teach you about leading a better life and training other species including humans number one for you was gratitude having an attitude of gratitude number two developing uh, compassion you share that beautiful story about that teenager using a functional assessment in a challenging situation that they found themselves in at school Uh, you pretty much said ABA is the core of humanity (laughs) (laughs) I did didn't I (laughs) (laughs) Uh, number three uh, holding space for, for another person and then all about developing respect, uh, which led beautifully on to number four, which was consent. Um, and you shared some great stories about helping uh, the teenagers and the children, um, some of them with learning difficulties, connect the dots between working with animals and, and their daily life, which is awesome. I love that. Uh, and number five, you shared that beautiful quote from Viktor Frankl, uh, and that was about developing self-awareness. So just before we do head to the final question for the show, is there any final words you want to say on that topic? And thank you so much for sharing all of that with us, Pex. That was amazing. 
your oh, list of amazingness no. lived up to its name. <laughs> Excellent. I'm glad. No pressure, right? Um, <laughs> no, I think that, 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 kind of, that kind of sums up. I mean, I could have done a list of 10, um, but I felt like they chucked up quite nicely um, into, into those sections. And these are this is all stuff which is really only becoming clear to me in the last couple of years particularly. Um, and again, the influence of um, being a mum and, um, you know, having the little science experiment running around in my house, which is, which is what being a parent is. You're going <laughs> to, yeah, you're going to love it. Um, that's, yeah, that's where all that kind of came from. And it's um, th- that, that, that underlying thing that actually it's just, yeah, it has, it's made, I feel like it's made me a better person and it's made me a better teacher of people, which ultimately is my most important role in this world, I feel. Mm. Amazing. I'm looking forward to having, like you alluded to there, a science experiment join our house around about the 13th of March 2020. <laughs> hey, sadly, we are now at the final question for this episode, Bex, but we started off with you taking us back to when you were a teenager. You shared with us what you're up to in 2019 and where your thoughts are with all of that great stuff you just talked about. For, now, for this part of this uh, episode, though, I'd like you, please, to take us on a journey into the future and share what Bex Tasker would like to see happen over the next five to ten years in a horse uh, an animal and human and earthling training world I love that earthling training um, so in the horse world I am seeing um, rapid change over the last two three years um, towards uh, positive reinforcement training um, becoming more acceptable. It's not mainstream. It's still very niche in the horse world, um, very niche, and there's still plenty of, of judgment and people thinking that you're a bit of a weirdo, but um, I'm okay with that. <laughs> and it is becoming it is becoming um, more accepted in the next five to ten years. I would like to see it becoming mainstream. Um I've always felt, and I don't know how correct this is, but I've always felt like the dog world's maybe 10 to 20 years ahead of the horse world, certainly 10 years ahead in terms of clicker training kind of being a household. You know, if I ask my dog clients, do they know what clicker training is? Most of the time they've got some idea. Um, That's what I'd like to see in the horse world. Um, I'd like to see curiosity rather than defensiveness. So dropping the ego a little bit in terms of, yes, you've got 20, 30 years of horsemanship behind you. I'm not saying you're wrong. You've still got good training is good training and we can shape your behavior to use more positive reinforcement. And, you know, so, so more curious learners rather than defensive um, defensiveness, which is uh, pretty common. Um, and uh, an interesting one. Uh, I, I really like to see more options for uh, competition. See, I'm not a competitive rider anymore. I was in my teens, but I'm not. Uh, most of my clients are not strongly, heavily competitive riders. But I'd like to see more positive enforcement friendly options for competition because for a lot of horse owners, competition is an important part of their life. And, um, you know, um, I'd like to, so, so there's an there's a International Horse Agility Club, um, uh, which is a um, worldwide um, organisation where you can, um, it's obstacle courses basically, and you, but, so it's all about, it's all about horse-centred ethical training. That's the, the one example that I've got of, um, so I, I've, I've competed in horse agility um, internationally from my own home. You do it uh, online through video, um, and I can click and treat my horse during the competition course, and I don't get marked down for that. So that's the one example I have of a competition option that is positive reinforcement friendly. Um, so if there was more, you know, in dressage, the higher you go up the levels, the more aversive bits, and you have to wear spurs and you have to wear a double bridle and so it's not um yeah it's not it doesn't doesn't quite um fit with a positive reinforcement mindset for most people not that you cannot click a train at higher levels of dressage you can and also use bits but so that would be one thing i'd like to see just to give people more options basically um and like i sort of alluded to having more options for youth as well so pony club is still quite traditional comes from the, the british horse society there's a lot of you know i remember ticking ticking off boxes on the uh, certifications for kids at Pony Club and, you know, it was how to use your whip correctly and all that kind of stuff. There was certainly no box to tick about how to use positive reinforcement correctly. Um, um, And like you said before, Ryan, yourself, regulation, some kind of certification process, that kind of thing for the animal training industry generally can only be a good thing, right? Um, so, you know, I know that you're doing the, um, the Karen Pryor professional course and that's something which I am keen to do soon myself as well for the same reasons, basically, that I think it's important and, um, 
um, yeah, to have that that kind of thing in place so that people know what they're getting when they when they get a trainer. Yeah, awesome, and I really like the contribution there about you'd like to see more curiosity. I would as well. Brave learners. <laughs> Brave <laughs> learners. Is, before. Sarah Owings would say, mm. and that curiosity is something we talked about with Steve White on this podcast show. Hey, Big State does sadly now bring us to the end of this episode. This has been a ton of fun from myself and on behalf of everyone listening, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. It was an absolute, absolute honour to be on the podcast. So thanks, Ryan. We do, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnest, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. There's something there for absolutely everyone and we're looking forward to having you join the tribe. That's it for this episode though. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much everyone for listening. You'll hear from us again soon.